I've been asked to uh, speak to you today about uh, a topic that's close to my heart, even though I actually have no responsibility around athlete development at all. It can. It's not part of my job. Part of my job is just really at the highest level of sport performance. And I've spent the last three Winter Olympic cycles, so four years into Salt Lake City, the next four years into Torino, and four years into Vancouver, as the head of sport physiology and strategic planning for Canada's Winter Olympic Sports. And I'm based in Calgary, and even though, as you can tell by my accent, I'm actually British, I'm actually from London. But I've lived in Canada since January of 1990, went there to do my PhD, and my specialism actually is altitude and altitude training, which is why then when I finished, um, the Canadians kept me around um, for that particular topic. And I gradually moved away from being just specifically a sports physiologist now to sort of director of all programs. But very soon to my time in Calgary, and even when dealing with hockey with Team Canada since uh, basically 96, 97, um, I soon realized that many of the youngsters, typically aged 17 to 22 years of age, trying to make Canada's junior national teams in various sports, because the winter sports, that's typically where they're aged. Very, very few of them were particularly good athletes. So they had a physical capability about that, and they had a technical capability that was maybe a little bit deeper than that. And I wanted to find out why that was. And as I started to look down the system, the things they did, 10, 15 years before coming to try to make a team, there were big deficiencies. So if you think this was back in the mid to late 1990s, what was going on with those kids over the 10 years before I would get to see them? And unfortunately, the stories got worse. Physical education in schools, almost non-existent. In Canada, in many of the provinces, no physical education teachers are specialists in the elementary schools. So in schools from five years of age to 11 years of age, no phys ed teachers. Physical education is taught by the other teachers. In fact, when they do phys ed, they don't even change their clothes. They wear their normal other clothes. They may change their footwear. And many schools don't even have a gymnasium. It's really interesting for a country where most of the year it's covered in snow. So they don't really go outside that much. So kind of interesting. And then when they get to high school, so when they go to school from 12 then through to 18 years of age, phys ed is really a second rate subject. It's not treated seriously. Some schools, maybe they do it twice a week. <coughs> Some schools, they do it, they say they do it every day, but what they really mean is they might go for a walk. And that's it. And then school sport is all about the few. Not, doesn't mean every kid gets to do school sport. Maybe it's the same <coughs> 20 kids represent the school in the winter sports, and then they're the same 20 kids that play on the teams in the summer sports. And we're still not at every age group. So there will be the junior high, so that will be up to the age of 15, and then the senior team. So it's like a three-year age band and then another three-year age band. And it'd be one group of kids does the school sport. So a really depressing situation. And then on top of that, as we came through the 90s and the 2000s, the same for the United States, sport was becoming increasingly professionalized. Costs were rising. So now in Canada, only what, sorry, one in three children, so a third of the population of children can't afford sport. Can't afford sport. Too expensive. Hockey, where the strengths of Canada, for example, had been in the rural areas. Kids out, you know, where they would have to walk to school, or bike to school, or run to school, or even ski to school. And they would do lots of different things. And maybe they would work on the farm as well. And after school, they would play lots of different sports with mixed age groups, all playing and scrimmaging, whether it's, it was soccer or basketball or hockey or baseball or 
or whatever it might be. But gradually over time that shifted. Where the sports have become much more urbanized. And of course in an urban city, where can you play hockey? Increasingly in a very expensive, specific location, a rink. So the costs go up. Then what happens to practice? Because we can only afford to practice a small amount of time. Plus all the other teams are trying to use the same facility. All the different age groups. Plus the other disciplines. Women's hockey. Adult recreational hockey. Figure skating. Ringette. All trying to use the same facility. Costs going up. Less time to practice. And kids don't just practice outside anymore. In Calgary, there are even laws now, bylaws, where you cannot play street hockey. Why is that? Because adults complain the noise that the children play. Well, the traffic gets so bad that it can be dangerous at times. And because the climate has changed, you can't just flood ice outside sometimes now. It doesn't last very long. People don't put the effort in. So it's real challenges to activity. It's not just hockey, it's right across the board. So I got interested in the aspect of development. And coming from Europe, of course, I had a bit of a different attitude than my colleagues. I was very aware of the Eastern European information, particularly from the former Soviet Union, from the Eastern Bloc countries, East Germany, Bulgaria, Hungary, and then, of course, some of the other influences. Obviously, West Germany and the unified Germany, Italy, France, and what they tried to do. So there's a lot of very good information. And the other thing is the biology, the physiology of humans and how we grow and develop, particularly in those first two decades of life, hasn't changed in hundreds of thousands of years. We still develop in the same way. We can ignore those aspects and try to do something in sport very differently than everyone else understands about how humans develop, or we can get on board and try to help youngsters. So I'm going to take you through a bit of this journey. Now, I could have changed the title and said, well, we need to be doing what's in the best interest of the kids. Because here's the challenge, as you look across many age group sports, we often do things that are in our best interest, the adults, to make our lives a little easier, whether it's administration or whatever and not understand that it's actually all about those youngsters, not us. And if you get into age group sport because you want an easy life, then you're in the wrong area totally. It's probably the most difficult job in sport, age group sport. Because you're not dealing with something that's stable, you're dealing with youngsters that are constantly changing. So I'm going to go through a bit of a general commentary, I've done some of that. I'm going to give you a, sort of an overview of some basic concepts to, so you understand where I'm coming from, and then maybe some personal comments as well. My job, clearly, is to try to make you think. I certainly don't expect you to agree with everything I say. That's not the point of this. The point is to prod you a little bit and make you think. The other thing is what I say around, particularly some of the things I know about North America, may not necessarily work in the context of where you are based. We all have different challenges. We all have some similar ones as well, and I hope you'll take a lot from that. Some of you have lots of resources, some of you don't. Some of you have a different climate to other places and different challenges. Some of you have lots of players that come through the system, some of you don't. One thing I would say to you, for me, the hallmark of a good system is to be out, able to, and you may not know this phrase, this English phrase, is to outpunch your weight, just to outperform the statistics. And if you look at hockey in Canada, considering how many players start out in the system, we're terrible, absolutely terrible. There are towns, there's even one single town, and the name escapes me again, in Sweden that outperforms Ontario. One town in Sweden outperforms the whole province of Ontario in terms of actual conversion through to the highest ranks of hockey. So that's the challenge to all of you. California outperforms Massachusetts 
right now. Having a lot of discussion about that one in the United States. And California plays a lot of inline hockey. They don't even get near the ice. But they do an awful lot of skill work. By the way, they also do the same in soccer. But we get too bogged down in, unless it looks like this, it can't be hockey. Canada has that real weakness, particularly in its parents. And we don't educate our parents well enough. There's a message there. You have to get after educating the parents, or else you're never going to change anything, if you need to change it. Why would I show you a sandcastle? Just to get a message across. So let's say this is a figuratively your system right now. Okay? Looks like a pretty good sandcastle to me. Nice solid base, nice sharp walls to it. But maybe just down the road from you there's another hockey program. And their standards look like this. So all of a sudden your sandcastle, your hockey program, doesn't look so good. So what are you doing constantly to challenge yourselves to get better? The Japanese principle of Kaizen, continual improvement. I should be able to come back here year after year and you have done things to constantly move your programs forward. And just when you thought that was a good sandcastle, then this one appears and elevates things to the new standard. That's what sport's all about. An age group sport should be no different. The only thing is, you may not be talking about the performance, the games won, the plus minus. What you're talking about is the entire system of learning, how you move these youngsters through these periods of their lives so they're important and improved. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. Any kid that comes through any of your programs, whether it's one season or ten seasons, should be able to look back on that experience and say two things. I learnt a lot and I had a great time. You do that, you'll find the superstars, but more importantly than that, you'll find the kids that love the game. All of them. And they're going to be your parents of the future, <coughs> the coaches of the future, the people that will fund the sport will be the sponsors or maybe the team owners of the future and the administrators of the future. So remember that. Every kid you give a bad experience through, he's the person or she's the person out there saying, hockey sucks, don't get involved. That's not the message you want. You want to be the strongest brand in sport. That should be the goal. You need to understand that when we talk about player development, it is a process. It's a long process. The primary factor around performance outcome in the first two decades of life, the first 20 years, are all due to growth and development. That's the primary component. Nothing else. How do you piggyback? How do you springboard that process along? And it's a building block. And you can choose anything you like. You can talk about the big ones, such as physical, technical, tactical, psychological. You can talk about bits within the building blocks. If you took the technical component, puck handling, skating, passing, shooting, netminder, different bunch of skills. So they're all building blocks all the way through. So what are the main components? And as you start to look at your programs, whatever the age group, Think about the checklist of things that need to be within each of these categories. You've got the technical category. What does that mean? Well, obviously it starts with skating. That's a pretty foundation technical aspect. Can they skate? I guarantee every single April we will get a phone call in Calgary, classically from an NHL team, and it'll be something like, Steve, got a 23-year-old defenseman. Can we send him to you to learn how to skate backwards? And usually they say, for a week. Not going to happen. Even if you sent him to us for a couple of months. First off, we give him a rest, because usually they're very tired. Because no one bothers to look at recovery and regeneration, even in the programs. Not seriously. Not as you would with an Olympic sport. 
So you get rid of that, then they improve immediately just by doing that with them. Then you look after any remedial issues they might have. Then you build their strengths up a little bit so that initially, when they're fresh and not under pressure, they look as though they can skate backwards better. <coughs> I haven't done anything on the technical side. But of course we know that as soon as we put them under pressure or get them tired, they will revert back to the motor pattern they learned when they were 10 years old. So now we need a lot of time, several months, to really break the pattern down and build it up. But no one has that patience, so it never happens. And yet there are sports where people are patient and they do those type of things. But we don't. Not in hockey. Very rare. It usually takes a big injury with someone being away from the game for a long period of time to buy that type of time. But in the development years, there are no excuses. But we rush the kids forward every year. Doesn't matter whether they're any better, just because they're a year older, we move them up. Wouldn't be tolerated in many other things. In the combative sports or in the artistic sports. That doesn't happen. You can either do something and then you move up. Or you can't, in which case you don't. In judo, everyone, no matter what their age, starts as a white belt. You learn all this stuff, you demonstrate you can do it, and you move then to your yellow belt. Whether you're 10 or 50. Then you learn a bunch of more stuff. And you do some competition, and you show you can do it. And then you have an exam, aka competition, and then move you up. Or not. Same in diving. We don't do that in the sports classically. We just expect kids to get better, whether or not we've taught them anything. <coughs> We're still, because they're a year older, even if they've still got deficiencies, we move them up. People that can only turn to one direction, maybe they can turn the other way, right handed player to protecting the puck to the inside, to the outside of the blade but they can only do it sort of so-so, they're much better going this way. But does anyone work going the other way with them? No. Don't do that. Tactical. The interesting thing about tactics, many coaches don't really pay too much attention to the technical. They pay a lot of attention to the tactical. Things they can control, they understand moving the kids around and they create lots of little robots. When this happens, go and stand on the blue line. Don't really tell them why, just go do it. See that? Go do that. Then after you do that, just run over there. But it's a free-flowing game, so part of the tactical element is decision-making. And teaching youngsters to understand the flow, what is coming at them, being able to predict, anticipate, be able to react very quickly. So they can change the nature, understand when they go to a zone defense, when they go to a man on man, or whatever it might be. Understand game theory, because they're all the same these games. Games of penetration, <coughs> all five of them, even backed up by the goalie, penetrate into there. Or resist the penetration of the others coming at you. You can learn a lot by reading military textbooks. Because the theory is all the same, but no one does that. No one challenges you really think. Physical. I don't get too worried about the physical side myself, even though I'm a physiologist, particularly in youngsters. It's going to take care of itself most of the time, and then there are specific moments that you have to go after things, and you better understand the growth of maturation so you take advantage of those things. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But also wrapped up in the physical aspect is just taking care of yourself. Understanding as a coach, as your athletes start to get a bit older, 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age, there's a very powerful weapon in your armory that has nothing to do directly with training. And that is recovery and regeneration. And the best coaches understand that you train, but you need to recover and regenerate to allow yourself to take advantage of this. Any idiot can train hard. It takes an understanding of the entire process of how you package these things together to get to the better performance. Something the Russians understood 
very well the peak of their powers. The psychological component, the psychology to deal with training, particularly when trying to do things that they're struggling with, to overcome some of the challenges, particularly through failure, and then the psychology of competition. Then there's the psychology for the rest of their lives in terms of doing the things that allow them to come to practice and concentrate on practice. They're worried about other things, and you're not going to get the best quality training minute out of them, are you? And then lifestyle. Again, as they get older, so maybe you've got like a 17 or 18 year old. So you only get to see them, maybe you manage to see them five days a week, let's say that. But in each one of those days that you get to see them, you only see them for a few hours. I don't know, maybe it's four hours total. What do they do with the other 20 hours? They go home and recover, get ready for the next training bout. When you tell them to have a day off, what does that look like? Because you're expecting them to come back ready to do something like this shit. So lifestyle is very important. What you're going to see along here is the first two decades of life in years, roughly from two years of age to roughly 22. Up here is a percentage scale. This is 100% of the adult state. So up here is eventually where an adult human gets to. Okay? The first line you're going to see is the neural development curve, aka brain weight brain size, the nervous system of the body developing, if you like, the information highway, the internet of the body, if you like. Okay? And it looks like this. So you can see that the human brain and the nervous system develops capacity very quickly, very quickly in the first decade, decade and a bit of life. And then gradually as it moves towards its adult state, it slows down. And in around here, in around 10 to 14 years of age, the brain will start to ruthlessly shut off those information highways it doesn't use very much. This alone should scream at you. And I mean scream at you. Come at you and slap you around the face and tell you exactly why children need to do many different things. That includes even in hockey. So in hockey, in the first years of their experience, they need to do absolutely everything you can imagine. Now out here, don't think that the brain development is over. Modern brain research over the last 10 to 15 years clearly shows that as we move through life, we can still continue to build the brain. We just don't have the same level of change capability as we do in that first year, first few years. And just like the energy systems, there's a power and a capacity. So we build capacity here in this first decade, decade and a half, and then we learn how to use it. We build the power of the brain based on how much capacity we've built. Is that clear? There's another little story here. Lots and lots of different experiences, build lots and lots of skills, okay, and then gradually refine them. Pretty simple. People ignore this. And this information has been available in the academic literature for a long time. But in sport, for some reason, we ignore it. Compared to this particular line, this is an example of one of the key hormones in the body. In this case, the circulating levels of the male sex hormone testosterone, present in both males and females, but obviously at a much higher circulating level in males. This is a very, very important hormone in the overall signaling mechanisms around growth and maturation, particularly as you come past the major growth spurt. This hormone is extremely important in the ability to lay down muscle mass. Little point in doing hypertrophy training, training to build muscle mass in a kid pre or during puberty because there's not much testosterone around not going to happen so kids get stronger before the age of 13 or 14 very differently than afterwards here before they go through puberty and while they're waiting for this post pubertal growth they're getting stronger because of the neural system think of this 
to do a bicep curl, maybe they're going to do a chill as a little kid. They gradually learn how to contract the bicep and relax the tricep. Get the idea? So they're actually learning to use their muscles. If they learn to use their muscles better, they become stronger. They're also growing. So that's just like overload. So they're having an inbuilt overload component just because of the fact that they're growing. So again, they get stronger. But it's different compared to out here, where now, with the right type of training and the presence of testosterone, they can lay down more muscle. So again, you can see there are sequences naturally inbuilt into kids as to how they develop. two very broad categories, the neural side and then the physical side, we get an overall sort of S sort of shape, a sigmoidal shape, a period of rapid development here, first few years of life, a period of relative stability, look at both of these lines, and then unfortunately as we come through the pubertal growth spurt, the adolescent growth spurt, lots and lots of big changes going on there. All hell breaks loose for a while until they reach the adult state. So from a sequencing point of view, if you're just doing broad brush strokes, the type of program you would do with kids, lots and lots of different things. Don't worry too much about strength and conditioning in terms of what you might think for more senior players. Very different. Do all the basics in here, agility, balance, coordination, running, jumping, throwing, kicking, striking, all those type of things. Lots and lots of different basic movement skills, learning to run, learning to throw, learning to strike, and then gradually moving them into more specific. Learn to skate, learn to swim, ride a bike, learn to skateboard, learn to inline skate, all that type of stuff. Learn to throw, learn to catch, and then gradually move those into the sport specific domain. And certainly by the time you get to around 14, you really want to make sure that all the basic components are there. All they're there. They just won't have the size, typically. They won't have the power and the strength that they will have later on. But technically, do they have the ability to receive a puck coming at them at light speed? Do they know how to conserve the momentum? Or do they just stick their stick out? Do they have the actions? Do they have efficient ways to skate? They know may not be that fast yet, but can they actually skate? Can they turn in both directions? Can they drive off each foot as they get back up off the ice, depending on how they've fallen? Do they know how to move on the ice? Look at the number of players, even at high levels, that look like klutzes when they're actually put under pressure. The guys who, quite literally, you watch, cannot perform a technical task whilst skating. They actually have to glide to make the pass or receive the puck. You start gliding, and there's no more real massive momentum for you, is there? You're going to get caught. And that's because their brain can't process the ability to do a gross motor task and deal with a fine motor task. You can teach these things. Even at the highest level, guys that have to glide to do something technical. It's pathetic. Next one, same two decades of life, slightly different x-axis. Here, this is what I'm going to show you the rate of change in height each year. Okay, so this is about 12 to 15 centimeters a year change in height. This is about 5 centimeters change in height, about 1 centimeter. Okay, here's girls. So, a lot of growth when they first come out of the womb, little baby, growing very quickly, okay? They grow very fast, but it slows until about the age of two, but by the age of two, you've got this, suddenly this little human standing next to you. Then there's a period of relatively stable growth, maybe somewhere between three to five centimeters a year, something of that order, in some variation. Now, it's not consistent, it's not like uh, you spread the 
five centimeters out over the year, and in January it's like 0.4 of a centimeter, and then February it's 0.4. No, it's fits and starts. One minute it's like 0.1 of a centimeter, and then in the summer months with the sun, maybe you suddenly get three centimeters. Okay? Fairly stable until this point in girls first, and we know girls grow sooner than guys. At around nine, ten years of age, you'll suddenly see a massive upturn in the rate of growth. And that will continue accelerating on average to about the age of 11 or 12, plus or minus a year. And this point is known as peak height velocity. <coughs> and gradually, the growth spurt will start to decline until they finally are no longer growing and they've reached their adult height. With me on that? Okay. You know that. You see it. And you see this. The guys grow later than girls. But they end up taller, which means their actual magnitude of growth has to be greater, right? So this is boys. This is about 14 years, plus or minus a year. So what it means is, as you start to look at the age groups, where would you expect to see the biggest differences in the physiques? Typically, it's in and around these years for the girls, so between 11 to about 13, the biggest differences. And in the boys, somewhere between about... I don't know, 12 through to about 16. Biggest variation. And here's the other interesting thing. Obviously the things that contribute to height are the bones that we actually use to give us the height in the first place. So the arms don't really contribute to height. Okay? But they do grow very early on. The long bones of the arms. Along with the long bones of the legs, the lower extremities. So in the sequence of how the skeleton grows, it's the long bones first. But, but they're a bit inconsistent. So one minute the kid looks like an orangutan, the next minute they're all legs, the next minute they're not an orangutan, the next minute legs. Okay? And that contributes to this massive change in height, the legs. But for a 14-year-old boy, if I ripped his femur out, the thigh bone, ripped it out, turn it on its end, cut through it with a chainsaw so that we could look inside, looking for the trabecular bone, which is a sort of fine honeycomb bone inside that gives the bone its tensile strength, its ability to withstand loading forces. Unfortunately, in and around here, for both the girls and the boys, that bone is not that well developed. The bone has grown lengthwise first, the growth plates close, so you don't get much more height, but the bone is actually quite brittle. So here's the femur. It doesn't withstand a, bone, a, a, a force coming at it from the side. So it's no wonder that kids get lots of fractures in this period of time. They're very susceptible to that type of stuff. Do so you know a crunchy bar? Chocolate thing and it's got like honeycomb in the middle. So you can imagine a crunchy bar. We cut through it, peered inside, but there's no honeycomb in the middle. That will now start to develop here about 18 months after peak height velocity. And these dotted lines represent the rate at which bone mineral density is being laid down. And you know what the primary driving factor to do that is? Loading forces. Loading forces on the skeletal system. This is why it's absolutely critical in these age groups that kids do also lots of different types of physical activity because you want the loading forces coming at the skeletal system that builds a very strong matrix, very thick honeycomb in there. But if you imagine, if all you do is run, or all you do is skate, or all you do is swim, or all you do is play tennis, the loading forces only come at you from whatever the sports loading forces are. So this is why you want the kids to do other things whether it's through the off-season for your particular sport. Another reason for not in these younger age groups to necessarily do the same sport year-round, or at least do other things. Very important. That period here, just like the previous graph, very important in terms of teaching lots of basic movement skills and then the basic sport-specific skills. So learn to skate, now learn to skate with a stick in your hand, learn to start to do something with a puck, etc, etc. Learn to use a striking action or hitting action in terms of what you're doing with a movement or an implement. 
Now start to do that in hockey, blah, blah, blah. Learn to catch something, like a netminder, but at this age you want all of them playing every position, all the way through this period. Now this period, look at the ages here. This is often when we're trying to make lots of decisions for these youngsters. And yet, this is the period of biggest disruption. You have no clue, no clue where you're going with this. You're not comparing apples with apples through here. It's apples and kiwi fruit and bananas and oranges and God knows what else. Real challenging. And worse still, there are massive dropout rates in the girls right here and in the boys around here. Often because none of us have any patience when we're trying to win the next meaningless tournament. <laughs> you need to understand this. Right in here, okay? 85 to 96% of the age group champions, depending on the sport and the gender, are not the people that win at the senior level. Not the people. The unfortunate thing in hockey is because we're often looking at short-term results, we pick predominantly all the early developers. We literally throw away at least a third of the possible real talent because we have no patience. And I'll show you some of the stats on that in a minute. The other challenge is that these are average lines, of course. So there are differences as to when people grow, so you can shift the lines forwards and backwards. You can also change the lines that way as well. So a kid might grow at the same point as everyone else, but maybe they don't grow as much. Or they grow much slower over a longer period of time, but still end up the same height. But they don't end up being six foot two until they're 20. But they got chucked out of hockey because they were still only five foot eight when they were 17 and you were making some big decisions then. Oh, he's too small to play hockey. Well, hang around for three years and he will be. <clears throat> you don't know that, but you don't have any patience. But your term I say, small but skilled. So what do you really value? And when? What's on the dashboard at that moment in time? And whose life are you trying to help? So this is a very difficult time for age group coaches. It's why it's the most difficult job in the world. The other thing is the brain. So you look at the the physical side, and you think you know a lot about what's going on. What about inside the brain? It's beating at a different time frame. And any of the slides I'm showing you can have, we'll make sure you get a PDF of all this stuff, okay? So five years of age, roughly down to 20. This is a scan of the brain. From an immature brain to gradually more mature. So as it turns from the yellow to the indigo purple, it's getting more mature. This is about 15 years of age, 15, 16, 17 through here. And we're interested in this part, the frontal lobe, the prefrontal lobe, okay? This is a part of the brain that is responsible for things like risk management and assessment, dealing with authority, timekeeping, um, dealing with authority, all of the things that are not present right there. It takes a few more years for those really to develop. This is why Teenagers don't tidy their bedroom. They take risks. Even when they have a watch, they never turn up on time. And you give them a heck for it. And yet that's just how they're built. Because they are not miniature adults. And even though they may look, because they're six foot, they're 17, and they're 200 pounds, and they look like an adult, but because you don't really talk to them and listen to them, you don't understand that they're a kid inside. It's a real challenge. You have to communicate with these kids because they're still kids. They may act as though they're all mature and all that type of stuff, the facade, but not happening. Which is why you get these type of photographs. Two girls, born to the year 2000, okay, 13 years of age. Little girl, young woman, same year of birth. And you see it all the time, I just look at the kids around here. Or well, these guys, two 14 year olds, <coughs> so born 99, that would be. Okay? This guy's shaving already. This guy's a little kid. But here's the difference remember the brain stuff I showed you? So you treat this guy like a young adult. 
you're all buddy buddy with him and he gets the in jokes and all that type of stuff. Yet the reality is he wants to run home and play with his Lego after practice. Whereas this kid, this kid, you treat him like a little kid. And he's going home wondering, why does coach talk to me like I'm a little kid? He knows everything that's going on in Swedish or Finnish politics. He reads the newspaper every day. He can beat your hands down at chess, but you're still treating him like a little kid. Because you're not dealing. They're camouflaged. They're here to screw you up. Not deliberately. It's just the way they are. Here's three 14-year-old gymnasts. Who do you think's winning right now? Look at this guy. He looks like Adonis. Some Greek god. The only thing is, he's actually not that good. He's just good right now. Maybe this little kid, who's kind of getting the message that he sucks, because he can't even get on the pole. But maybe he's got the determination. He actually has the agility, the balance, the coordination. He has the determination to really be good. But right now, he's not winning anything. And he's really starting to doubt whether he should continue with this sport. Worse still, his mum comes along, she picks him up in a little mini van. She says, I'm spending 400 euros a month on you to do gymnastics. You suck. I'm not saying that's necessarily true, but you can understand what's happening to this kid. And we keep telling this kid, we keep giving him the meaningless medal. Oh, here's the certificate. You did fantastic. You won the last meaningless gymnastics competition. By the way, you're not that good, actually. But you don't send any of those messages. You should be trying to be encouraging, understanding what's going on with this kid and what's going on with this one. By the way, to this one you might be saying, you're doing very well, but we need to really work on these few things here. Because unless we work on these few things, when you move to the next level, you're going to have a really tough time. But he's concentrating on doing all the stuff he's already good at, that he likes doing, that doesn't hurt. But that's not going to get into the next level. You get this type of stuff. This is hockey. This is the distribution of birth months of the Ontario Hockey League and Western Hockey League players. Okay, currently. <coughs> this is known as the relative age effect. So the hockey catchment year administratively, January the 1st, December 31st. You can see that in the first third of the year, January, February, March, we have, there's 30%. We're at uh, 42, by the time we get here, 52, by the time we get out to here, 60, by the time we get to June, we're about 75% of the players born in the first half of the year, close to 60% in the first quarter of the year. So here's the moral. Remember, this is an important stepping stone to the NHL. You want to play in the NHL as a kid? Make sure your parents had sex in <laughs> April the year before. Holiday in Canada, I think. Absolutely. Especially a cold April. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. In Russian too. Yes. I have a power one on. Yeah. 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 September. Yeah. September. Yeah. September, I think. I'm going to put them all in that town. After New Year. Yes. Yes. Give them some of the things. Cheap out. So here's the issue for you. Why is this happening? Okay, and it's supported by Le Rivier's work. And he can show you the younger age. So Professor Le Rivier is at the University of Montreal in Quebec. Elite midget, and you can see the trend is already set up at that age group. And if we went the next age group down, you'd see it again. Because what's happening is people are focusing on winning in the short term. Winning without necessarily having all the building blocks, just win. Okay? So who do they select? They select the people with the speed and the power, predominantly. That means predominantly the slightly larger people. If you're born earlier in the year, you have a greater chance of being ahead of the growth curve than the people born in December, on average. So gradually, the whole system means that it's focused towards the people born earlier. You can see then that moving from midget to the NHL, the NHL draft is starting to look more and more at these two groups to select them going forward, and less and less at this group. And that's what I meant about us throwing away Huge amounts of talent in this system. And it's not just hockey. I can show you loads of sports where this happens. It's also true in school. Kids born late in the academic year. Higher levels of depression. 
suicide and poor performance in school. There are consequences of adults not understanding some of the decisions. This is purely an administration decision around the catchment year, and there are no easy answers. Because if you suddenly made the year start in like August 1st and run around to July the 31st, if we didn't change our behaviour, a few years down the road we'd see everyone born in August, September, October. You understand what I'm saying now? Okay, so there are no easy answers to this unless we understand what we're looking for in the younger age groups. And we should be focusing on skill. Skill, not simply the adult statistics, <coughs> plus, minus, games won. We should actually be looking at, can they play hockey? That should be the question you actually ask. I'll throw a kid apart. Show me what you can do. Knock yourself out. What is on the dashboard at 8 years of age, at 10 years of age, at 12, at 14, at 16? They're different. What is in the, uh, the technical competency of the rhythm? What about the locomotion, how they ski? What about in the brain, the tactical component? What about how they actually um, perform a particular task on the ice? And then what does that look like as they move through the ranks? What's your technical checklist? And then your tactical checklist. What should a kid be able to do after two seasons in the game? Four seasons in the game? Regardless of their size. That's coming along. You can't even control that aspect. So you need to understand this long-term process. You have the biology, which you can't do anything. That's the underlying genetics. They're ticking along to that biological development. That's just part of their makeup. What you can control is the interventions, what you do. What does the environment in which you coach look like? Is it tough but fair? Is it an iron fist but in a velvet glove? Do you have high standards of expectation but also patience and understanding? Do they understand that they're going to fail more times than they're going to succeed? And if they're doing the reverse of that, one of these days they're going to get a nasty shock. And unless you prepare them for that failure, you're going to be in trouble. So what do you control around that? Are you consistent in your decision making? So they know exactly what is going on. And do you value the things that are appropriate for an 8 year old versus a 10, versus a 12, versus 14, 16, which are different from by the time they get into the very highest ranks of them? Do you build a physical literacy? So just like in school, you go to school and you learn basically starting off Reading, and then writing, and then some arithmetic. The academic literacy. Do those two, three things, it kind of opens up the doors for the rest of school. So in sport, maybe it's how you interact with the ground. Running, jumping, throwing, kicking, striking, agility, balance, coordination. In the water and on the water. In the water teaches you a lot. Water and being in it is an alien environment. No kidding for us. We're not designed to be in the water. We've accommodated, adjusted. But those first few times in the water for a youngster, panic stations. Throw the kid in the deep end of the swimming pool, you might as well put in some dish soap, throw your laundry in, because they're going to do a good job of cleaning it. <laughs> First time they put their head under the water, panic stations, until they learn to control that panic, hold their breath, open their eyes, breathe out, swim around. Pressure sensitivity as they learn to scum and swim. Then on the water, it's an interesting one, on the water, one of the best unstable surfaces that you don't actually have to invent. And the wonderful thing about that, it's, it's out there in the environment. You're only limited by your imagination as to what you do. Learn to canoe, kayak, sail, stand on a log, stand on a surfboard, stand on a paddleboard. All the type of things that boring gymnasium and strength guys want you to do on a wobble board in front of a mirror. And yet you can do it on a lake, on the sea, having fun in the summer months. And they didn't even know they were doing it. But they're learning all about balance and agility and coordination. What does your summer camp look like? You don't even need to go near a rink. You just need a field, some trees, a hill, 
and a lake. And you can have the best hockey camp in terms of development going. Snow and ice. Now, snow and ice, together with the cycling skills, along with the rollerblading, along with the skateboarding, um, those type of things, all go together. Why? Because snow and ice, plus cycling and rollerblading and uh, everything like that, allows you to get after balance and pressure sensitivity at speed. That's extremely difficult to replicate in a gymnasium. You understand what I'm saying there? Very important. Skiing skis, thick skis, learning to jump, learning to throw a 360, pressure sensitivity, great transferable skills from everything, from riding a mountain bike down the hill to understanding how you lean on your skates, to how you lean on your skis. Inside edge, outside edge, weight transference, out of balance, whatever it might be. Very difficult to replicate those things. But with snow and ice, and the wheeled sports, you can do it. Maybe that's part of the repertoire that you put into your off-ice training. But you don't call it that, you just say off-ice experience. And the summer stuff you put into your summer camp. Man, they could be busy 24 hours a day in the summer. Doing all skills that are highly transferable into hockey eventually. And you fold them because it was new and exciting and not even hockey. And they can have fun doing it. In the air, this is where gymnastics comes in. And you may laugh at me, but I'll tell you absolutely why these are important. Gymnastics and dance. Now, I'm not talking about it being you wearing a tutu and all that type of dance, but dance where rhythm is involved in music. Because rhythm is inherent in every sport. The rhythm of the slap shot, the rhythm of the skating stride, the rhythm of the glove save. These are vital, and rhythm is set up in life probably before eight or nine years of age. Same with pressure sensitivity, probably before the age of six or seven. Now, can you do remedial work to catch it up? Yes, you can, but you've got to work harder at it. You have to see those kids that are naturally skate very quickly, very early, early on, in terms of their technical competence. So they often shy initially. Why? Because they can skate. Everyone else is still struggling to stand up. But you can help them along if you really understand that process and how you move them past each of the sticking points that they get trapped on. And then obviously every combination of that. What I'm going to show you here <coughs> is more about many of these systems you see in the world around athlete development and where do they come from. Because they're Many of them, depending on the type of bias they come from, they're actually very similar. So here you have the first 20 years of life. Here's grade school from grade 1 and about age 5 through to grade 12 and age 18. And you'll see lots of things in the literature like this. You'll see systems that have sort of basic training of some kind, whatever that might be, then intermediate, <coughs> advanced, and finally elite. That's actually kind of like education where the elite maybe is, I don't know, trade school or university or something like that, okay? Then you have others like this, this is more of a psychological one, where they describe them as the child, this is infant, child, juvenile, junior and adult. And then here's a version from sport, this is a fairly famous one from Jean Cote. He talks about this one, this is more of a sociological one of sport, rather than, say, one of the hard sciences, so it's not coming out of say biology or physiology, this is on the social side of things. And here talk about where kids enter sports, those decisions are usually made by the parent. They make the choice, put the kid into this sport, this sport. And then often they start to do, for a few years, quite a few different sports. And they call that the sampling period. Then the kid, by this age, is starting to make decisions, oh, I want, I want to do that sport, really. I want to stay with this one. So they start to specialise in you know, a few, maybe it's seasonal. And then finally, they might be saying, if they're really interested, I want to spend more time in maybe just one sport, or two sports, one in the winter, one in the summer. So they invest heavily. And then finally, if they really have the drive and the aptitude, and the reason why the question mark is there, maybe they have the opportunity to go on an elite route. And then you've got something that we've done in Canada. And we followed some terminology from one particular individual, 
more on the sports side called Nice Fran Bailly, who originally started with a learn to train, train to train, train to compete, and train to win four stage. We just made that a little bit more sophisticated because we want to be interested in all Canadians. Because here's something you should also understand. This one here, I'll come, I'm going to come back to that. Okay, I'll come to that. Okay. You need to understand this. Every child, every last one of them, is an athlete. It may not have anything to do with things. It's a continuum, like anything else, from those that are very, very competent, from those to less competent. And here's why. Because life itself is an athletic event. 75 years on the planet, if we're lucky. Largely aerobic endurance, with a few sprints and a bit of lifting thrown into the fun. That's, that's life. You have no idea when the kid appears in front of you really where they're going. None. <clears throat> Particularly the younger they are. You can move every kid forward. You can improve every single one of them. So I want you to understand that. So we developed a model where, as I said, learn to train, train to train, train to compete, train to win. Moving them through this. This is active for life. And what we did, we stuck a few, a couple of earlier ones. We were concerned about kids in the first few years of life, zero to six, because I told you things are important. Agility, balance, coordination, rhythm, dance, gymnastics. We need to get after those early on. Where are those programs? So we thought that we call it active start, leading into a fundamentals period, with the emphasis on the word fun. Why? Because we know fun is so important. If you look at the last two major team sport studies in North America as to why kids stay in sport and why they leave sport. And they looked at things like basketball, American football, Canadian football, soccer, hockey. And if you look at the hockey data, all the way from Canada's initiation program to major junior, as reported by the players themselves, the number one reason for staying in hockey, having fun. The number one reason for leaving hockey, not having fun. What brings them back each week, each session? You need to think about those things. So we built a model where, of course we're interested in this, but we're interested in every kid. And we, if we build up this, this is our physical literacy, the first few years, building all those skills in every kid, and then gradually getting them to specialise. It's a generic model, doesn't work very well for female artistic sports, because that's much younger, okay, so you have to adapt it for them. Remember in figure skating and gymnastics on the female side, they're often looking for little girls physically, but with the minds of much older women. Kind of a conundrum there. They're looking for the reverse of what sometimes we're looking for in other sports early on. The challenge for us is we get a few kids going this way and lots of kids dropping out around here and go this route. Okay, they just do other stuff, but it's not formal. The problem is in Canada we don't have any opportunity, one, for late entry, or two, the opportunity <coughs> to come back into sport once maybe you've grown. We lock people into hockey here at about 10, 11, 12, and then they get to 15 and then we tell them they're crap. Okay? Not going to make it. So they all get disillusioned and leave. In fact, right now, Canadian golf is actually sitting right here going, come on over, you hockey players. You've got good work ethic, great hand-eye coordination, and ability to swing and implement. Have we got the sport for you? <laughs> so there are other sports looking at hockey in a mercenary way. Come on over here. And they're growing very rapidly. Golf went from zero to 6,000 golf in schools programs in one year. Just by having cheap, cheap equipment put into the schools and the PGA, the actual professional instructors, going into schools and teaching phys ed teachers how to do a basic swing clinic with kids. And then they would link the school with a local club program. Right. All because we tell people suddenly they're crap. And we never get them back, even if they're not crap. So we have a model like this. It's just a model. And here's the issue. That happens to be out. I don't care what the boxes are as you grow. 
You could label them anything you like. The red box, the orange box. Box one, box two, box three. I don't know. Calgary, Stockholm, Helsinki, Oslo. Moscow. Doesn't matter. The key thing is, what are you doing here with this age group? What are you doing here? What is the dashboard that they've improved and they're moving to this level? That's what's important. So I don't need to focus too much just on how we've done things. We take a lot of criticism for adopting these names, but we, we don't apologize for it. It's what we're doing, and some other countries have followed suit. The only thing is, what might be in here for Canada would be roughly the same as other countries, but there might be some subtleties that are different, depending on we've got a very big country, small population, short summer, you know, quite different than if you're in, I don't know, Abu Dhabi. So we produce this document. It's a good little document for right now. You can turn the pages, you'll see all the resources in there, some suggestions on season lanes, all that type of stuff. Just a guide, it's just like having a roadmap. That's all it is. If we rolled forward five years, that document needs to change and improve. Every year we need to improve the Japanese principle of Kaizen, continual improvement. Here's the United States version. The American development model, also very good. They're even very honest. They just they don't talk about superstars, they just talk about kids having potential. The other one you have, and I was talking to the Learn to Play group the other day. So here we have the physical literacy year. So this would be like zero, this is 12 years of age. Here's the Canadian Sport for Life. Here's then a Hockey Canada specific version. And then here's what we're doing with the IIHF. So here's our first three stages. You can see the slight difference in the years. No real difference between males and females early on. Then because the girls are growing faster, they come to the so the uh, process is quicker. Hockey Canada, because this is generic across sports, it's a bit broader. Hockey Canada, because they know their target, they know what they're trying to do, they have a little bit more specific stuff. They can even tell you where the kids are doing it. So early on, they just stay in their local community. They don't need to travel very much. But as they come up through here to about 12, now they've got a bit of travel, and they go to a provincial competition, a regional competition, that type of stuff. If you did it at the club level, you could even write in here who's the coach. How much is it going to cost as you get more specific? Now when you come to the IIHF, they're dealing with the whole planet. So of course it's going to be a little bit broader. So they're going to only have two basic things. But if we looked at actually what the content might be, you'd expect to see very similar suggestions all the way through. Because the kids are essentially the same. There may be just different challenges. Maybe they haven't been exposed to the basic ability to skate in certain parts of the world. So you have to spend a bit longer with them, or they're coming in later. But can you teach them basic hockey skills long before you even put them on skates? Yes, of course you can. Because you could teach them to inline skate. You could teach them to play ball hockey. You could teach them to strike the ball. Everything. You could certainly teach the basic actions of netminding long before you even put them on ice. You just have to be open-minded and creative, depending on your situation. So again, it comes back to the dashboard. So I'll go back to that. The dashboard, a bit more complex than the one I showed you. And the dashboard gets a little bit more complex as they get older. You've got the big things you've got to worry about. Okay. You've got a few other key things. And then maybe in the middle, you've got a little bit of a menu that you change. Maybe that's the individual menu. Or you've got to work a little bit more at your skating. You've got to build, you know, your netminder, we actually need to work on your butterfly a little bit more. And that dashboard will look a bit different in two years' time. But the key thing is, what do your standards look like? What would you expect a kid? Where his hockey gear is on the ice, you throw him in the puck, and you say, two minutes, show me what you can do. Show me what you can do. Here's a nine-year-old soccer player about to show you what he can do. At one point, he even points at the crossbar. At one point, he's playing with the ball, pulls up his trousers. And where do you think he learned this stuff? Structured soccer session? Or at home? Playing, being creative for countless hours, challenging his friends. 
Points the cusp off. Anything in the world, and God can trust an architect, doctor, maybe an actress. Yeah, but nothing comes easy, it takes much practice. I know I can. I know I can. A nice if smile to finish. If I work yeah. hard, yeah. if you speak this in Oki, every time cross me. Yes. <laughs> so, when do you give the kids that? What kind of, not homework do you give them? What kind of play work do you give them? Do you give them a whole pouch of Swedish training rules? And, a, and, a, and some tennis balls, and maybe even a coke can. Go home, do some stuff, read back next week, show me what you can do. Because you can imagine that kid who can do that, what you can do with that person. You can shape them. He's now 17 in the Bayern Munich program. But that doesn't happen by accident. Countless, hundreds of thousands of hours of just play and creativity. And you need to kids, you need to inspire them. That's why you've got to create environments that are fun yet challenging. And one of the most important things is kids learn through copying, particularly up until about the age of 14, 15, and particularly from 8 through to 12. Mimicry. So who the hell are they copying? And interestingly enough, it's not just the superstars. They often copy, preferentially, kids in their own peer group and kids slightly older than them. Why? Because the kids in their own age group and the kids slightly older than them are close enough that they can taste being able to do those things themselves. And if you can't demonstrate doing something, you need to find someone that can. Because if they're going to copy you and you suck, <coughs> you know what you're going to get. And there are lots of tools that you can use now, video to show. Or you can have, there's nothing you shouldn't take it personally if you have to bring in a kid from your next age group up who can actually demonstrate for you something that you need to do if you can't do it. That's actually showing good judgment. That's showing leadership. But make sure your examples are right where they need to be. Time on task, absolutely vital. So that kid spent a lot of time on task. You need to think about decision making. We don't want to build robots, remember. So what are you doing about teaching decision making? Putting them in situations where experience is really helping them. And they're building on that. That's the purpose of the games when they're younger. Not winning. It's about putting into practice everything you've taught them. Can they now put it into practice in a pressure situation? That's what you should be looking for. Regardless of what happens in the score, does the power play do what it was meant to do on offense or defense? Did the play, did the team do what you wanted to do in their terms of the passing? Was their pass percentage up? Did they cut down the number of shots on goals? Who's better defensive actions? These are the things that are important. That's telling you about whether they're starting to learn how to play the game in hockey. They're going to make mistakes. Good. Absolutely, it's one of the ways they learn. The thing is, how do you turn that? to become the positive, to move them forward. This is good coaching. I don't know of a single person at the elite level who has won all the way through their career. In fact, the vast majority of people I know in Canada have failed miserably for years on end and relentlessly pursued excellence and then won. The United States had a whole survey of exactly the same thing. Interesting enough, done back in 2000 showing where all their champions come from. They do lots of different sports in the early ages, and they persevere through mistakes, even the greats. And then game theory. As I said before, all the games, largely the same, penetrate and resist. Penetrate and resist. Understand the flow of the game. Where are the gaps? Look for the gaps. Learn military history. The art of war. Sing ta. No, that's the beer. <laughs> I'll get it, I'll get it right when it comes back. <laughs> you see where my mind is. Okay. <laughs> the art of war is a very serious book. 
very serious book. And you can learn a lot for sport from books like that. We should be grand strategists. In, in coaching courses, we should learn a lot about strategy. That's what it's about. And you view it serious. But you need to pass that knowledge on. And you need to be able to show ways to show the kids what does that look like when they're out in the middle of the ice and they've not got you right next to them. What does that look like? How they can make the decisions. People that can react no matter what the team opposing them is throwing at them. Dictate the game. Dictate the flow. Understand the difference between training and competition. Understand that competition at times can be the highest form of training. The highest form. In fact, it's even the highest form of monitoring. You know everything. I'm, I, get, I get amazed. I'm a sports scientist. I watch a game and the coaches sometimes, particularly the young coaches, they watch the same game as I do, and yet they come to me and they want me to do fitness testing. And I just watch the game. I can tell you. Did you watch the same game? Did you see that guy over here? He sucked. Late in his shift. And as the game went on, by the time the third shift, he was coughing up a lung. And you want me to do fitness testing? Why would we bother? We know what he's like. He sucks. He's got to do some work. Or the guys that can't execute a particular thing. Man, he always loses the puck to the right hand side, or whatever it might be. Never in the lane. Never on time. Always a metre behind. Well, he needs some speed, perhaps. Or he hasn't got the skill. If you watch the game, all the information is there for you. And then, when you want to investigate deeper, you have a very specific purpose to investigate deeper and commit those resources. But the answers are all there, right in front of you. And again, with your coaches, you should have those discussions. What do we see? Understand that Instead of just looking at the wood, look at each of the trees. And look deeper inside the challenge. Not just sort of glaze over. That means at times when you want to do that analysis, you need to be fresh yourself. Recovery and regeneration for you as a coach is important. So you can have those discussions. And you should learn to sit around a table and be able to look each other in the eye and call a spade a spade and not get upset personally with each other. When I work with coaches at the highest level, it takes us anywhere between six months and three years to develop that relationship where we don't get upset with each other when we challenge. Is that what we're really seeing? Remember this, a child is only 10 years old once, 12 once, 14 once. What I mean by that, you have a very small Kodak moment in time. You don't even get to see them for the whole 365 days of the year. You get a few days. So you better understand what is the quality training minute that you have with each of these kids. And do they understand that? And that's where the homework and the other stuff, the other activities they're doing is so important. You can piggyback off that. Or you can push some of that responsibility back to them. And allow them to play and be creative. Remember that every kid turns up, they're basically just like a a paint box. And each kid is going to use that paint box differently in their lives. But your role is to help them, to steer them along. A six-year-old is not half a twelve-year-old. You understand what I mean by that? So we draw all these linear models. You know, year one, year two, and year three, and we treat every year as the same, but it's not the same. Kid is six, six years of experience. The first few years, I can't even remember that, so that's a waste of time. But then they get to seven, and that year now is worth a lot more than the previous year, because they're building all the time. And then to eight, and then to nine, and in the same way, a 12-year-old is not half a 24-year-old. And you should expect this exponential growth, this blooming. So what are you doing to help move that along? And it comes back to the challenges and expectations you give. Understand that little symbol, the symbol for play, used on every computer. Now, universal. This is not wasted time. When these kids have some downtime, except maybe here, they should be resting a little bit. But when you get them out on the soccer fields and other times, this is good time if you structure it right. 
Don't just totally leave them to their devices. Give them a few pointers, then stand back and watch what they invent. This is an important slide for you because it's from Sobolak, who's in play at the very, very highest levels of hockey at times. So this is the development activities of elite ice hockey players. Not crappy players, the best. Okay, it's a relatively recent study, 2003. Number of hours per year across the age groups. So the best. Deliberate play. So that means when they went home, they would play soccer with their friends, they would play street hockey with their friends, they'd play some lacrosse in the backyard, all that type of stuff. Deliberately doing an activity, in other words. Not just meaning the stuff, not just playing, I don't know, um, Doom on the computer or something. They played lots of other sports. Look at the age groups. And look how they actually created more and more hours in other sports, even through here. Very seasonal as well. They weren't doing year-round hockey. Well, they don't do year-round. compared to organized games. Now obviously they're playing many more hours of organized games as they improve the standard of play. I just sat on a, well actually the year before last, on a, a, a hot stove panel in Chicago with USA Hockey and we had uh, Igor Larianov, one of my heroes, one of the greatest players of all time, won absolutely everything. And he was talking about his experience growing up in Russia. Rarely in these years, between here to here, did he play more than 40 to 45 games in a year? Rarely. Typically in the winter what would happen, he'd come home from school, as soon as he dropped his bags off, he'd go outside, play on the outdoor rink with his friends, different age groups, just scrimmaging around, doing all the creativity stuff, challenging each other, playing, then they'd get called in for supper, do some homework, and maybe there was in a half an hour before bed, they'd go out and play again. All completely unstructured. Then they have their practice, Two to three practices a week, one game. Two to three practices, one game. Canada at the moment, Pee Wee and Atom, you'll be lucky to get a practice for two games. And then deliberate practice. This is where they're really focusing on hockey. And it is interesting if you look at the NHL, or probably the best teams here in Europe, that they have a lot more practice time than games. Completely the reverse of the kids. who really need it. In Canada, we could forget all about this and move that here, but this yellow line would be down here. That's what we're doing. This would be, just to bring it home, it would be like this. And you wouldn't accept it. Let's, let's, do, a, let's do something that you wouldn't think about. Uh, let's uh, 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 play the piano. Okay? So this is what hockey looks like in Canada at the moment. In sort of novice... Pee Wee, Adam Pee Wee Banton. Maybe not so much Banton. Well, maybe. On Wednesday, you go to your piano lesson, you open up the piano, and you're allowed to play middle C, okay? Middle C. Five times, ten times. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, okay? You're allowed to do that five times every 15 minutes. Okay? Dun, 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 dun. That is the equivalent of doing roughly an eight second flow drill and then stand at the back of the line for two minutes twiddling your thumbs, waiting to go again. And then, on Saturday morning, you have to turn up in a big auditorium and you have to play a recital. <laughs> Only you've got 200 screaming adults sitting right behind you. So we all laugh. We laugh at that, don't we? Because you know that's not how you're going to learn to play piano. And yet we do that in sport. And you know the stats of the game. You know the stats of the game. Yes, there are three 20 minute periods. But you know, the average kid would be lucky to get 15 minutes on the ice. They're only going to have the puck for a few seconds. And you keep doing that year after year after year after year and expecting them to really get good? How's that going to work for you? Think of another activity that will bring it home for you. The game of golf. The whole purpose of golf at the highest level is to hit the ball as few times as possible. 
That's how you win. A few times. But how do you get good? <laughs> By spending years of hitting billions of balls in many different situations, with different weather, with different psychological tasks in front of you, there's a lake there. You know you can hit the ball 150 yards, but you still manage to jib it 10 yards straight into the lake. <laughs> because it's playing with your mind. No different than pressure in a hockey situation. Oh my god, it's that big defenseman again. Or this net minder. I've never managed to get a goal past him. So we laugh at all those things, and yet why do we keep doing the same crap? Over and over again, that's the definition of insanity if you're expecting different results. You don't need me to tell you this. So with organic growth is the theme of my story here. Lots of different experiences. What, what kind of experience in your hockey club are you growing these kids through? Every last one of them. You know after a period of time who the kids that have some promise. You know that. You don't want to get into a situation where you value other kids with less promise any differently. Because they're going to be your parents in the future, your coaches in the future, the administrators in the future, maybe even the club owners in the future. You want to build that brand. Everyone loves hockey. Great experience and I learned a lot. Those two things. Here, for me, is what athleticism looks like. You don't actually see in this particular clip any juggling or hitting or throwing. But this is probably one of the best proponents of parkour at the moment. He's a British guy called Damien Waters. You'll see him doing lots and lots of practice in a gym safe setting where he can learn how to do the moves before he takes them outside where now there is great risk if he gets it wrong. He's not a gymnast. So I don't see that. In fact, if a gymnastics coach looked at how crude he was in some of these moves, he'd probably shake his head. But it's a great authority, great understanding. So you can imagine again, if we have hockey players that don't have to look exactly like this, but we're improving their capability, just in the same way that young soccer player, so that when they step onto the ice, they are totally, totally comfortable in that environment. They can turn in both directions. They can have two goons hanging off them and still thread the needle with the pass. They don't need to start gliding to do something with their upper body. They can receive a puck at light speed, even off balance. And they can get up off the ice very quickly and skate to full speed because they have great technique. And they understand the gaps and the flow. So they know, they know exactly where they have to head for and they can anticipate conserve their resources. So here's Damien. Have some fun watching. <laughs> Thank you.
conservation momentum, understanding where he's moving in space and time, believe it or not, all important skills in hockey. Conservation of momentum is an important one. What's the players that can do that? The ability to take a gross motor skill and impose a very fine motor skill. To have a great distraction, a gross motor skill, and then have someone shove you and still execute the manoeuvre. That's no different than hockey. It happens all the time. As soon as someone's right next to you, leaning on you, pushing you. And you look at the number of players that then also have to glide under those situations. Incredible. Couldn't do it in this sport. You end up falling off a building. So I'm going to finish up with a few things for you. <coughs> Although we talked a lot about genetics and the overall biological stuff, understand your role in changing behaviour. Very important. And what you set up. I cannot stress this enough. And also the use of tradition in sport. What are the powerful traditions? Tradition in the Hockey Canada dressing rooms. No one. And I mean no one in Calgary walks on our logo in the carpet in the middle of the floor except the person that vacuums the carpet. None of the players, ever, ever, ever. No staff. Important tradition. Our timekeeping. It sets part of the underlying discipline of what we're about. So what are yours as you start to build that culture of expectation and a culture of excellence? Because excellence comes about through good habits that stand the test of time. So here's one. Interesting enough, life expectancy difference in the city of Glasgow, in Scotland, is 28 years between those who are rich and those that are poor. 28 difference in life expectancy. This is 2013. This is a G9 nation. And why is that? In other words, you could predict your life expectancy simply by your postcode, because obviously the rich live one area of Glasgow and the poor live somewhere else. And what is it to do with? It's largely to do with behaviour and resources. The rich, they get out of the city at the weekends. They only want to do one job in the family. They eat better. They have more downtime and activity. They have recreation and sport. The poor family often have maybe two jobs, maybe three. Ironically, they eat expensive but fast foods. They don't get out of the city at the weekends. Their kids don't do the sports as much. And it's all to do with behavior. So one thing you need to do is change the way your children, and I'm talking about these 15 year olds as children, change the way they live. Just think about how they behave, things they value around here. Do they open the doors for you? Do they look after the equipment? What does the dressing room look like? You need to nurture them along. You may think these are silly things and they're tiny things, but it's all about how they gradually start to have respect, ultimately for themselves, as well as their teammates and for their lives. You look at the Fortune 500 companies and you take the biographies of the leaders and there are often two people that always are always referred to in the books of these great leaders. Donald Trump, the Iacocca, Bill Gates. And do you know who they always single out? Teachers and coaches as being positive influences on their lives. And these are the guys that run the biggest, most successful companies. Not even athletes. So change the way the children live, not the way they are. You can't do much about that responsibility issue, the time keeping, all that, but you can start to nudge them along. You can't deal too much with just the fact that they are be irresponsible at times. Because they're children, they're youth. But they don't always take kindly to authority. But they learn. So this is all to do with behaviour, and you have a lot of ability to change those type of things. And it comes back to now designing things and not leaving things simply to chance. So my last clip for you. What I mean by design chance? I, I really stress to you that the brain is developed very early. 
But I do want to make sure you understand there is lots of room for remedial programming if you're patient. And I'm going to show you a clip from one of the greatest percussionists of our time, Neil Peart. Do you know who he is? Played for the band Rush. Okay? Not just simply a drummer, a percussionist. And he, when this clip was shot, was about uh, late 40s, or maybe <coughs> early 50s, certainly late 40s. And he's talking about, even though he's one of the best drummers in the world of all time, trying to play a rhythm across the top of the waltz beat that he's playing with his feet. And that's actually a very difficult rhythm to play things across the top, particularly something that's uh, syncopated. Okay, not synchronous with the beat. It took him months and months of practice. And then finally, he's able to do this particular sequence. So what I'm trying to say to you is, you can definitely teach an old dog new tricks. But just like trying to teach that uh, defense with the skate backwards, you have to take the time. And the beauty for you, the younger you've got them, the more time you have. So you get a 13 year old, and on your technical checklist, you've seen that this kid can't do these things. So are you going to just let him get by for the next season, still doing the same stuff, just getting worse, digging a bigger hole for himself, or are you going to do something about it? Because otherwise you're going to hand that off to the next coach, who's going to have the same problem. And he's going to be concentrating on winning games with the team, so he won't do anything about it. And so all you've done is contribute to the challenge. When I first started working on this to try to do something, it was all I could do really just play the foot pattern and then try to start introducing the simplest possible sticking the across it. That's how it started. Do they understand the process? 
They understand what you're trying to do. Do you communicate that with them? When they make a ruling, does it make sense? But it's got to make sense for the kids. Not for necessarily the adults. If it makes more work for the adults, tough. Because it's age group sport. It's about the kids. Parents, you have to spend a lot of time here. What does the FAQ page, frequently asked questions page, look like on your website? So you can head off most of the questions immediately. What does the information package look like for your U12s or your U14s? Do they understand what's happening this year with them, with the, with the players? What their responsibility is and what's going to happen next year? And others, the media for example, if you explain things clearly to them. Who are the tame, who are the nice media people that you can get the message across quickly? It takes a lot of effort to do this. That's why people don't do these things. One of the best books in leadership that I get any high performance director or coach to read, the first book, remember it takes six months to three years for me to build that rapport and relationship when I start working with a coach, is Rudy Giuliani's book. Know who Rudy Giuliani was? Is? He was the mayor of New York City at the time of 9-11. Okay, and he wrote a book called Leadership, just simply Leadership. The chapter titles alone are like a checklist for high performance in anything. Chapter one, first things first. Chapter two, prepare relentlessly. But there's one chapter in the book called Weddings Discretionary, Funerals Mandatory. And what he meant when he described things, as the mayor of New York City, whenever there was a funeral, he made it absolutely mandatory that there would be a city of New York representative at the funeral. If it was someone who used to work for the city, someone whose <laughs> spouse had worked for, uh, you know, the person worked for the city, a supplier to the city, or even a partner to the city, they would always have official representation there. Whereas for weddings, sometimes they'd send someone and sometimes they wouldn't. And the rationale was this. Weddings are easy. They're easy to do. They're fun. They're uplifting. You know, there's the ceremony. There's the promise of the future. There's good food, alcohol, bridesmaids, all that type of stuff. But funerals are hard work. You've got to make an effort to go to the funeral. The conversations are difficult. They remind us all of our own mortality. It's a downer. Even if you go to an Irish funeral and they're a little bit more upbeat, it's still deeply depressing and sad. And that's no different than performance sport. Every one of us will have weddings on one end of the continuum and funerals on the other. The athletes who constantly practice their weddings, the stuff that they're already good at, that doesn't hurt, that doesn't take much effort, and they will shy away from the things that they're not very good at, the things that really take effort and the things that hurt, and yet these are the things that can often move them to the next level. What about your own weddings and funerals? Perhaps you hate administration. That's your funeral. Now, you may not have to solve that directly if you've got some help. Maybe you've got an assistant who likes administration. Solved. Help them. But if you're on your own, unless you pay attention to this, you're not going to move your program forward. So understand these elements. Very important. And that book's an excellent book in trying to bring things home to you. Very serious. Education of all those people, crucial. Communication, very distinct, very clear, don't have to write a massive essay, just the key points. Explain what you're doing all the time. And vital with the players, of course. And appropriate. Remember the little boy and the young man, understanding who the audience is. The dashboard concept, I can't bring it home enough. Just keep it simple. What does the dashboard look like for each of the age groups that you're dealing with? How are you moving them forward? And on that note, I've said enough, and I thank you very much for your time.